Hi everyone. In this video we're going to review the relationship and sexuality education in Ireland. The areas of discussion will be 1. What is driving the RSE agenda? 2. What could the RSE agenda potentially lead to? 3. The history behind RSE in Ireland. 4. Some important extracts from the 2019 NCCA report. 5. Significant differences between when RSE was introduced in the 1990s and now. 6. RSE from an international perspective. 7. RSE and the law. And 8. What can be done to stop the RSE agenda? So, part 1. What is driving the RSE agenda? In my view, it is Marxism and a desire to turn children into social justice revolutionaries to bring about utopia. I appreciate that that's a fairly hefty statement, so we're going to break it down. 174 years ago, Karl Marx drafted a now infamous document called the Communist Manifesto, which was an attempt to solve the problem of oppression in society. Marx developed a theory that divided society into classes, with those who owned property being the oppressors and those without property being the oppressed. This is called classical Marxism. As far as Marx was concerned, wealth was accumulated through the exploitation of the working class and his theory therefore sought to dismantle the class structure through the abolition of property. Marx believed that if a benevolent dictating authority forcefully took ownership of all wealth, property and resources, that it could be redistributed in a more equitable manner and this would be for the common good. Remember that term equitable, we'll come back to it. History, however, informs us that while communist societies stagnated and suffered through persecution and starvation, leading to tens of millions of deaths, capitalist societies through the same period of time flourished and prospered. This rather inconvenient fact forced the new Marxists called neo-Marxists to shift their policies away from class struggle to the politics of identity. So identity politics is a structure which grants more or less privilege to groups or individuals based on immutable characteristics such as race, gender, sexual orientation, age, disability, ethnicity, etc. Instead of trying to control society through class conflict, they are now trying to control society through identity. In order to exert total control over society, the new Marxists discovered that they needed to destabilise five key pillars of culture, and these are religion, the family, education, media and law and order. And one of the methods they are using to destabilise the family is to destabilise children by confusing and sexualizing them. And this is where the new RSE programme comes into play. So what's the point behind destabilising children? Well, once you destabilise a child's identity, they become disaffected, dissatisfied and mentally ill. And this makes them politically groomable. So they can be manipulated into becoming revolutionaries for the Marxist cause, which is to exert total control over society, as in communism. The children end up hating and rebelling against their parents' morality, which they refuse and reject and potentially rise up against the older generations, who they now see as repressing them and who are unable to understand them. The Marxist agenda is to turn your children into social justice warriors in order to further their agenda of communism. And they do this by making your children so confused about their identities that they become mentally and emotionally unstable. And this makes them easy to manipulate both sexually and politically. So part two, what could the RSE agenda potentially lead to? It could lead to mental health disorders in your child a breakdown of the family unit to the point of uprising against the older generations, a contribution to the breakdown of society in general, and total control through the successful implementation of communism. So we're just going to touch on two points under this section, that's mental health and total control. So in relation to mental health disorders in your child, this is not our opinion, this is from the statistics. In March 2016, the former president, Mary McAleese, launched a groundbreaking report on mental health of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex people in Ireland. And this report found that 56% of LGBTI who were aged 14 to 18 years had self-harmed, 70% had suicidal thoughts and one in three had attempted suicide. So compared to the wider population of young people in Ireland, LGBTI young people had two times the level of self-harm, three times the level of attempted suicide and four times the level of severe or extremely severe stress, anxiety and depression. 
in relation to the exertion of total control over society through the implementation of communism. The RSE agenda is one way in which they intend to do this. However, there are a number of other factors also in play. These factors include the regulation of expression and speech through the introduction of hate speech laws. An equitable justice system which takes into consideration your immutable characteristics and your thoughts before prosecution. This is hate crime law. The abolition of the private ownership of goods, so you will own nothing and you will be happy. This is the referendum on right to housing. And then the absolute control of resources such as water, food, energy, etc. And many of you may have heard over the last number of days that Eamon Ryan is talking about taking control over oil reserves in the country should an emergency arise. So a few moments ago we said we wanted to explain the term equity. To be clear, equality and equity are not the same thing. Equality means that all individuals should have an equal opportunity to pursue their goals with achievements relying strictly on merit through talent and productivity. Nothing else is taken into account. Under a system of equality, the most talented and productive person gets the job. In an equitable society, talent and productivity are shown less consideration with more emphasis being put on your identity group, such as your race, gender, sexuality, ability, etc. In order to ensure an equal outcome, Fairness must be put to one side and resources such as money and power diverted to ensure equality of outcome. Very simply put, equality refers to equality of opportunity, whereas equity refers to equality of outcome. Noting that equity is the foundation that communism is built upon. So a question to ask yourself is, if you had a business, would you prefer to hire somebody based on merit? So hire the best person for the job based on their qualifications and experience. Or would you be happy with the government telling you that you must hire somebody based on their race, their gender or their sexuality? To be clear, that's what they're doing with the likes of gender quotas. I would expect that most people would prefer to hire the best person for the job. So the third section we will look at is the history behind RSE in Ireland. Prior to 1994, there was very little in terms of sex education in Ireland. In 1994, the Minister for Education set up an expert advisory group on relationships and sexuality. And in 1995, that expert advisory group presented an overview of the main issues regarding the introduction of RSE in Ireland and concluded that the school had a role to play in supporting and complementing the work of the home, while stressing that parents are the primary educators and therefore should have a major role in influencing developments in this area. This report from 1995 put forward a framework for RSE which was mindful of the role of parents in the school community as well as the school ethos in shaping delivery. In 1995 the Department of Education also issued circular M495 titled Relationship and Sexuality Education. In this circular schools were directed to begin the process of developing a school policy in collaboration with parents, teachers and management so that they could start to introduce RSE as part of the wider aspects of SPHE in the 1995-1996 school period. So if you take a look at this M495 circular you should pay particular attention to section 6.1 which is the rights of parents. This section states the following. In deciding to include an RSE programme as part of SPHE in the school curricula, the rights and duties of parents to provide for the religious, moral, intellectual, physical and social education of their children is acknowledged. While the home is the natural environment in which RSE takes place, most parents look to schools for support in fulfilling their obligations to their children in this area of development. Consequently, the school is seen as playing a supportive and complementary role to the home in this task. It is envisaged that this will be achieved by involving parents with management and teachers and where appropriate with pupils in a collaborative exercise towards school policy development. This policy will make provision for the rights of parents who hold conscientious or moral objections to the inclusion of such programmes on the curriculum and will state how the school intends to address these situations. In 1998, the Education Act was enacted. This act enshrined in law the child's right to social, personal health education, with Section 9 of the Act requiring that every school use its available resources to 
promote the moral, spiritual, social and personal development of students and to provide health education for them in consultation with their parents and having regard to the characteristic spirit of the school. So we jump from 1998 to 2010. In 2010, the Department of Education and Science issued Circular 22-2010, titled SPHE Best Practice Guidelines for Primary Schools. This circular confirmed that SPHE is a mandatory curricular subject in all primary schools. National and international research has consistently shown that the classroom teacher is the best placed professional to work sensitively and consistently with pupils and that he or she can have a powerful impact on influencing pupil attitudes, values and behaviours in all aspects of health education in the school setting. Also in 2010, the Department of Education and Science issued Circular 37 2010 titled RSE and this states the following. Schools have a responsibility under Section 9E of the Education Act 1998 to promote the moral, spiritual, social and personal development of students and promote health education for them in consultation with their parents having regard to the characteristic spirit of the school. So even up until 2010, the Department of Education was cognizant of both the role of the parents and the ethos of the school in developing and implementing an RSE programme. That said, the Department of Education was also starting to acknowledge that the classroom teacher can influence students' attitudes, values and behaviours. Then in 2012, the people approved the 31st Amendment of the Constitution, which provided for the insertion of a new Article 42A relating to children. It's important to note that this referendum was passed by 58% of voters on a turnout of only 33% of those eligible to vote. So what does Article 42A state? Article 42A states the following. In exceptional cases where the parents, regardless of their marital status, fail in their duties towards their children to such an extent that the safety or welfare of any of their children is likely to be prejudicially affected, the state as guardian of the common good shall, by proportionate means as provided by law, endeavour to supply the place of parents, but always with due regard for the natural and imprescriptible rights of the child. So, if you as a parent are determined by a court to have failed in your duties, the state, as guardian of the common good, can take your place. As we go through the next number of sections, you will see that there is a clear policy shift after the 2012 children's referendum. In 2014, the National Policy Framework for Children and Young People, 2014 to 2020, was published. The vision of the policy was stated to be the following. Our vision is for Ireland to be one of the best small countries in the world in which to grow up and raise a family and where the rights of all children and young people are respected, protected and fulfilled. Where their voices are heard and where they are supported to realise their maximum potential now and into the future. In 2015, the Gender Recognition Act was enacted. The purpose of this act was to allow persons over the age of 18 years to make an application for recognition that they have changed their gender. Also in 2015, the Department of Children and Youth Affairs published the National Strategy on Children and Young People's Participation in Decision Making 2015 to 2020. This strategy states, the goal of this strategy is to ensure that children and young people will have a voice in their individual and collective everyday lives across the five national outcome areas. The strategy focuses on the everyday lives of children and young people and the places and spaces in which they are entitled to have a voice in decisions that affect their lives. One important section to note in this strategy is section 4, which deals with supporting implementation and talks about the legal supports available to ensure the voice of the child is heard. One of the legal supports it states are available is the children's referendum in 2012. 2016 is the first point at which we see the introduction of LGBT policies. So in 2016, an oversight committee for the LGBTI plus national youth strategy was established. Also in 2016, being LGBT in schools, a resource for post-primary schools to prevent homophobic and transphobic bullying and support LGBT students was also published. In 2018, the Department of Children and Youth Affairs published the first ever LGBTI plus national youth strategy for the years 2018 to 2020. 
Also in 2018, the Minister for Education and Skills asked the NCCA to undertake a major review of RSE in schools, with one of the specific areas for consideration being LGBTQ plus matters. I clearly can't even get all the letters right. So this review from 2018 is the review that we're still currently going through. In 2019, the NCCA published its report on the review of RSE in primary and post-primary schools. In 2021, the NCCA published the brief for the redevelopment of the Junior Cycle SPHE for consultation. One point of significant note is the fact that section 2.3 of this paper deals only with student and teacher perspectives, disregarding the voices of parents entirely. In fact, as part of this brief for consultation, the role or authority of the parent is not mentioned even once in this paper. Not once. In 2022, the NCCA published a consultation report on the brief for the review of Junior Cycle SPHE. And this report included feedback sections for students, teachers and other stakeholders. In July 2022, the Minister for Education opened the NCCA consultation phase on the draft SPHE curriculum, including RSE for Junior Cycle. This consultation phase remains open until the 18th of October 2022. In this section four, we're going to review some extracts from the 2019 NCCA report and the consultation that preceded this report. So this review took place under three specific headings, drawing on studies and research, in consultation with key leaders, organisations and individuals with expertise and experience in the area of RSE, and working with schools. So what do you notice missing from this list? Parents. It has become a common theme over the course of this review of the RSE curriculum, which commenced in 2018, that the voice of the parent has been significantly downgraded to that of other stakeholder or individual. On the screen is an extract from the NCCA report. Under the heading Consultation with Key Leaders, Organisations and Individuals, it states the following. The review consulted with key leaders, organisations and individuals in Ireland and abroad, including government agencies, non-governmental organisations, support services and academics. Their experiences and perspectives on the contextual reality of RSE and practice in Ireland provided an important evidence base for consideration in the review process. Organisations, interest groups and key persons who are or have been directly involved in the provision of RSE were invited to attend bilateral meetings, roundtable discussions and two symposia consultation events on RSE. The NCCA through its website invited other interested groups and individuals to engage in the review process via online surveys and written submissions. So this is the only way in which parents were entitled to contribute to the RSE consultation through online submissions and surveys. So in relation to the online surveys, the first survey was conducted in November 2018 and you can see from the graph on the screen that students responded 512 times, teachers 1,333 times and parents 7,891 times. It's not surprising that parents were very interested in the curriculum that their children were going to be taught. But how did the NCCA respond to parental interest in the education of their own children? Well, first of all, they said that they confused the Education and Skills Report on RSE with the Objective Sex Education Bill. And second of all, they said there was an organised campaign targeting individuals who were opposed to the role of the school and the state in providing RSE. And that this campaign gathered momentum during the final weeks of the consultation with a website launch, leaflet drops in the Greater Dublin area and beyond and visibility on social media. From this statement, we can surmise that the NCCA disregarded a number of the parent submissions because they considered those submissions to be part of an organised campaign. So let's see what a few of the organisations and key leaders who were invited to participate in the consultation actually want covered in RSE. So abortion rights campaign states the following. They want inclusive education. So they state that all young people, regardless of their gender identity, should receive the same RSE. As adults, we need to understand and empathise with people of all genders and sexual orientations, and we need the appropriate education to do so. They state, laws governing the age of consent must not infringe on young people's rights to receive sexuality and reproductive health information and education. 
Children and young people must learn about their rights to make decisions about their own body. This can begin at a young age under the theme of your body, your choice, where children are taught that they can accept or refuse physical contact. Amnesty International is part of their submission refer to the human rights of pregnant people. Another group called Belong To state that LGBTQI inclusive sex education should be taught in schools and there should be less heteronormative in school books in both primary and secondary schools. They also state that we would submit that engagement with sexuality education must not be optional or determined by the ethos of a school board. Belong To also go on to state that as confirmed in the LGBTI Ireland report, 12 is the most common age for a young person to realise that they may be LGBT. However, many begin to discover this much younger. We propose that 5th and 6th classes in primary school should also be introduced to diversity, inclusion and equality around gender and sexual orientation. They also recommend that LGBTI plus identities should be included across subjects to create visibility, value inclusion and to highlight role models for young LGBTI people. The next person, Kira Fagan. The reason I'm mentioning her is because she's a primary school teacher. Kira Fagan states, the most common age that children realise they are LGBT is 12 years and therefore children in 5th and 6th class are realising their LGBT identity in primary school and some children are much younger. Children can identify as transgender in junior, infants or earlier. She said, I really believe there cannot be ambiguity on this issue. Children need to be given the opportunity to talk about sexual orientation and gender identity in a safe, non-judgmental and age-appropriate way all the way through their primary school life. She goes on to state that she would like the following included in the RSE curriculum. Different families, including families led by same-sex couples. Gender identity, masturbation, different relationships including LGBT plus relationships, sexual intercourse between a man and a woman, a man and a man and a woman and a woman, abortion and miscarriage. Dr. Kira Kelly states there is no mention of pornography there, just a vague allusion to the internet. But porn is something that almost every primary school boy has seen by the time he graduates sixth class. We need to be bolder in how we speak to kids about these issues. We need to remove religious ethos influence from RSE curriculum. We need RSE to be mandatory so schools have to deliver it. The curriculum needs to be focused on what kids are actually doing and seeing, not focused on what we'd like them to be doing or seeing. We also need to talk openly about sex and how it's a pleasurable experience, not something we need to be prudish at all about. Talk about orgasms. Talk about the mechanics of sex. It's not something to be ashamed of. Another contributor, Dr. Sarah Jane Kelly, states, It is unclear to me why parents can choose to disempower their children by not allowing them access to RSE content. Yet the study of the Irish language in mainstream school, which has little implication for their overall well-being, is so closely policed by the department. Another organisation called Shout Out states the following, We feel RSE should include information on the variety of ways humans can display sexual characteristics and the reality that chromosomes do not always determine sex and sex does not always determine gender. Although this is not the focus of this exercise, Shout Out feels strongly that this should be included in the science and biology curriculum as well, so LGBTQIA plus identities can be woven into the narrative of learning. Another contributor, Squashy Couch and Tusla, state the following. In relation to challenges, some cultural acceptance of LGBTQ plus community in schools is needed. For example, few schools have gender neutral toilets and have restrictions on uniforms. This organisation also goes on to state the following in relation to fluidity of identities. It should be highlighted that identities, including gender identity and sexual orientation, are not always a static concept and people can change over time. Similarly, all identities should be respected and not challenged. So the main takeaways from the consultation process in my mind are the following. 1. Stakeholders suggest that students should have access to factual scientific information free from bias, but at the same time, Those making these submissions often make reference to the fact that such information contains concepts such as gender fluidity, 
So there was a constant play on language. Two, some people believe the parents should not have the right to opt their children out of RSE. Three, many people believe that the law should be changed to ensure that RSE is delivered by all schools, regardless of that school's ethos. And four, the vast majority of submissions are in favour of teaching LGBTI plus sexualities and gender identity to very young children. So part five is significant differences between when the RSE was initially introduced in the 1990s and now. In the 1990s, the focus was on the rights, voices and opinions of the parent to the extent that the opinion of the parent was considered paramount. It was accepted that schools could introduce selected aspects of RSE according to the school's ethos and RSE was delivered very much from a factual biological perspective. Now the focus is on the rights and the voices of the child, coupled with the opinions of teachers and NGOs. The voice of the parent is not even considered secondary in some cases. The parent has been reduced to a stakeholder with their opinion given the same weight as any member of the general public. A majority of respondents believe that RSE should be mandatory and the law should be changed to force schools to deliver all aspects of the agreed upon RSE programme. And a majority of respondents believe that children should be taught about diversity and inclusion, but it is unclear how many respondents understand what these terms actually mean. In this part six, we will look at RSE from an international perspective. In this regard, the only document we are going to review is the 2010 WHO Standards for Sexuality Education in Ireland. So this document states the following. This document is intended to contribute to the introduction of holistic sexuality education. Holistic sexuality education gives children and young people unbiased, scientifically correct information on all aspects of sexuality and at the same time helps them to develop the skills to act upon this information. Thus, it contributes to the development of respectful, open-minded attitudes and helps to build equitable societies. A holistic approach based on an understanding of sexuality as an area of human potential helps children and young people to develop essential skills to enable them to self-determine their sexuality and their relationships at the various developmental stages. It supports them in becoming more empowered in order to live out their sexuality and their partnerships in a fulfilling and responsible manner. Sexuality education is also part of a more general education and thus affects the development of the child's personality. In this document, it was deliberately decided to call for an approach in which sexuality education starts from birth. The trend in Europe as a whole over recent decades has been to make sexuality education mandatory without opting out clauses that allow parents to withdraw their children from classes. So part two of this document sets out a sexuality education matrix and states the following. The following matrix has been designed to give an overview about the topics which should be introduced to specific age groups. So we're just going to take a look at some of the age groups and some of the areas that they think should be introduced. Zero to four years. The right to explore gender identity. That's zero to four years. Also zero to four years. Enjoyment and pleasure when touching one's own body. Early childhood masturbation. Zero to four years. Four to six years. Same sex relationships. Acceptance of diversity. An awareness of their rights. An open, non judgmental attitude. Respect for different norms regarding sexuality. Talk about differences. Gender, cultural, age differences. And again, talk about their rights. Four to six year olds. Six to nine year olds. Body changes. Menstruation. Ejaculation. Individual variation in development over time. A positive gender identity. Choices about parenthood and pregnancy, infertility adoption, sex in the media, the differences between friendship, love and lust, six to nine year olds. Also six to nine year olds, the positive influence of sexuality on health and well-being, diseases related to sexuality, sexual violence and aggression, name their rights, recognise and deal with differences, acceptance of diversity, the right of self-expression, Sexual rights of children, six to nine-year-olds. For nine to 12-year-olds, 
Again, body hygiene, menstruation, ejaculation, use of condoms, first sexual experience, gender orientation, acceptance, respect, and understanding of diversity in sexuality and sexual orientation, nine to 12 year olds. So in the next section, we're going to look at what is covered in the new proposed RSE program. So this junior cycle course in SPHE is said to be designed to support students in developing a positive sense of self and a capacity to care for themselves and others. It's designed around four interconnected strands and three cross-cutting elements. So these four strands are one, understanding myself and others, two, making healthy choices, three, relationships and sexuality, and four, emotional well-being. Then the three cross-cutting elements are awareness, dialogue, reflection and action. So what is expected from students at the end of this RSE programme? In the following sections, we will look at the learning outcomes that students are expected to have at the end of the programme. So under strand one, understanding myself and others, at the end of the RSE programme, students are expected to be able to appreciate that sexual orientation, gender identity and gender expression are core parts of human identity and that each is experienced along a spectrum. Discuss experiences, situations of bias, inequality or exclusion based on race, gender, sexual orientation and devise ways to create more inclusive environments. Communicate in a respectful and effective manner, including demonstrating the capacity to understand the perspectives of and empathise with others. Under strand two, making healthy choices, students are expected at the end of the RSE programme to be able to Discuss how to share personal information, images, opinions and emotions in a safe, responsible and respectful manner. Examine the risks and consequences of sharing sexual imagery online and explore why young people do this. Demonstrate how to access appropriate and trustworthy information about health. Strand 3. Relationships and sexuality. At the end of the RSE programme, students should be able to explore human sexuality, what it means, how it is expressed, what healthy sexual expression might look like and the difference between sexuality and sexual activity. Examine relationship difficulties experienced by young people in friendships, family relationships and romantic, intimate relationships. Communicate in an effective manner that can support responsible decision making about relationships. Investigate the influence of digital media, in particular the influence of pornography on young people's understandings, expectations and social norms in relation to sexual expression. And demonstrate how to access appropriate and trustworthy advice, support or related services. And in strand four, emotional well-being, students are expected to be able to examine different kinds of abusive and bullying behaviour. Explain why noticing and responding to abusive or bullying behaviour is important and discuss appropriate responses. Demonstrate how to access appropriate and trustworthy information and services aimed at supporting young people's emotional well-being and mental health. You can see there's a great deal of emphasis placed on diversity and inclusion and where to get trustworthy information from. It's also important to note that the RSE programme is intended to be assessed. It would be interesting to find out how a child who does not accept that there are more than two genders would be assessed. I would also advise you to have a look at this appendix too, which is the glossary of key terms for SPHE. The second last section that we will look at is RSE and the law. So the constitution confirms the role of the school is subsidiary to that of the parents. Article 42 recognises parents as the primary educators of their child. Other articles also have a bearing on education law, in particular the articles dealing with the family and religion, so those are articles 41 and 44. Articles 41 and 42 dealing with education and the family have been the subject of numerous court decisions which have found the following. The family is the main source of education for the child. Parents are entitled to provide education outside of the school system if they wish. The state may not force parents to send their children to any school or any particular kind of school. The state may require that children receive a certain minimum education. The state is obliged to provide for free primary education and this means up to the age of 18 years. So in addition to the constitutional protections offered, the Education Act 1998 also specifically states the following. A recognised school should provide education to students using its available resources to 
promote the moral, spiritual, social and personal development of students and provide health education for them in consultation with their parents having regard to the characteristic spirit of the school. Section 30 also states that the minister shall not require any student to attend instruction in any subject which is contrary to the conscience of the parents of the student or in the case of a student who has reached the age of 18 years, the student themselves. It is therefore settled both through the Constitution and the Education Act 1998 that parents and guardians may withdraw their child from any part of the school curriculum that they choose. So the final section that we will look at is what can be done to stop the RSE agenda. I would recommend the following. A. Respond to the NCCA consultation which is open until the 18th of October 2022. In this regard, we have drafted a submission that you may adapt and send to the NCCA. You will find it in the link in the description box of this video. B. Hold information sessions with parents so they understand the agenda behind this programme, the fact their rights as a parent are being eroded and downgraded by the school, the Department of Education and the NCCA, and the potential for serious mental health consequences if their children are exposed to this ideology. C. Opt your child out of SPHE and RSE while also insisting that the school provide alternative study arrangements and form broad-based parent coalitions to collectively petition as a louder voice. We will conclude this presentation by talking a little bit further about the draft opt-out letter. So this letter makes reference to Circular 13 2018, which addressed religious instruction and worship in certain second level schools in the context of Article 44.2.4 of the Constitution of Ireland and Section 30 of the Education Act 1998. The reason that we are referencing this particular circular is because the opt-out letter for RSE calls for similar arrangements to be made. Circular 13 2018 provided for the following. That those who did not want instruction in line with the requirements of any particular religion be timetabled for alternative tuition throughout the school year rather than supervised study or other activities. That a school must establish in advance the wishes of parents in relation to opting out of religious worship or instruction. That ascertaining parental choice in relation to religious instruction should be integrated with the school's processes for establishing subject choices generally. That the school must offer an alternative subject for those who do not want religious instruction. Parents must be made aware that such alternative tuition is available and be asked to choose between religious instruction and the alternative subject offered by the school. That once an opt-out has been expressed, it should be endured in subsequent years unless otherwise advised by the parent. And finally, that there is no basis for a school to intrude in regards to the reason for the opt-out in relation to the privacy of those who are opting for alternative subjects. The only information required is that the parent wants to opt out for the alternative subject. To conclude, we would ask that you please respond to the NCCA consultation using the template in the description box of this video. This consultation period closes on the 18th of October 2022. And we would also highly recommend that you opt your child out of SPHE and RSE while also insisting that the school provide alternative study arrangements. Thanks for listening.